Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. What you're about to experience is a free, worldwide interactive broadcast from Ontario, Canada. We broadcast live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Get your questions in. Join the community chat room at www.category5.tv or email us at live at category5.tv. And now, let's begin. Here's your host, Robbie Ferguson. Welcome to the show. It's Category 5, episode number 253. Nice to see you. Nice to see everyone. Yeah. It's how been are a while. You? I'm doing good. It has been a number of weeks, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. Having a good summer? Yes, I'm having a great summer. I um, turned 18 right after I was done oh. school. Uh, celebrate after exams. I graduated with honors and went hey, to go. Hey, congrats, with... buddy. Yeah, That's and great. Um, now I'm Dad going. Dad must be proud. Oh yeah, I thought he was going to cry <laughs> at my graduation. Yeah. <laughs> but um, also, after that, um, I checked out the university I was going to. Cool. Um, it looks pretty cool, like it'll be at Guelph Humber. Awesome. And then now, for the rest of the summer, I'm working as a prep cook at the Delawana nice. Inn in Honey Harbor. We were, we were talking before the show, so now anyone <laughs> who wants to you know, go, go meet Erica, now you know how. Um, we were talking about the show when I was younger, I worked at Muskoka Woods up uh, north of here mm-hmm. in Muskoka, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and and I worked uh, in the camp, and I stayed there all summer long. It was just a riot. So, but uh, now we had access to the fridge in such a way that they they would they would roast like these massive carcasses of meat. Mm-hmm. If you're a vegetarian, I'm sorry. This is going to get very graphic. <laughs> these things were massive, and they would they would serve it to the guests at the camp, and then yeah. whatever was left in the fridge, it's like okay, we'll cut off a piece and take it home with you because it's just going to go bad. It was wild. That was the best part of the summer, right there, was the meat. Well, so you're working in the kitchen. Yeah, like, I've never worked in a kitchen before, so I was very clueless on my first day. Yeah. And But, you know, like, I had a lot of people who were helping me out, and I'm just, like, I prepare, like, salads and all nice. kinds of stuff, but at the same time, pretty much whenever I like something that I'm making, I put it aside and just munch on it. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have a passion for cooking as well now, or well, just... I never, I never was a good cook before. That's the okay. thing. So now that I don't know, it's actually making me a better cook, and cool. now I can make my own food. And I know that when I'm on my own, I'll be okay. That's probably <laughs> where it's a good experience, right? Because here you go, and you don't want to be eating Mr. Noodle ramen noodles every night. No, Not every night. No. Most nights, yes. No, but I get to prepare the staff dinners and breakfasts at lunch. So I get like people from like all this, like, the other staff buildings are constantly coming up to me like like what's for dinner, what's for lunch, what's for breakfast. I'm like I don't know, whatever's left <laughs> over like that. That's what you guys get is leftovers. Oh boy. <laughs> and I I caught word on your Twitter account, Erica Lalonde one. I don't know why I put the one. I think you said okay to the wrong question. <laughs> Be careful of that. <laughs> Erica Lalonde one on Twitter. I saw a picture of the mural that you had completed. Yeah. And and actually, your your dad is is such a kind gentleman and and In actually my provided us right now. He provided us with <laughs> photos, which I'm not I'm not quite sure if that's a nice thing for him to do to you or if that is. They're they're okay. Some, some, okay, so you you had the chance to filter these. Like I don't know what's going on here. You're gonna have to tell us the story. Um, that was tubing around. Um, right after my exam, uh, he was trying to get me off the tube, and actually at the same time, my legs were 90 degrees in the air, and he calls <laughs> it the soup kitchen. So he was driving the boat, and he, he goes around in a circle. And crazy, and he's just going over waves, and you fly up in the air. But they didn't, they didn't get a it's pretty a epic shot, yeah. But that's the first one. All right. Okay. <laughs> so that, that what is that? <laughs> Wait, um, that was um in a country kettle, a nice little restaurant by the house. And you just happened to be up on the jumbotron on the bus stop. <laughs> I understand. Okay. Yeah. Um, nice that uh, that they caught a nice candid shot. Morning look. Um, yeah. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and here um, you are at graduation. Yeah, that's my graduation. Um, very funny story. She asked me if I was a niece of my Auntie Tammy, mm-hmm. and I said nephew because I was so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, was the microphone on you at that point? Or? No. <laughs> and oh, they yeah. didn't even say my quote card. Like, like Which his, is what? 
like when you go to graduate, you say something that you've always wanted to say. So oh. y- y- we got a lot of yo. Bruno Vega. <laughs> they didn't don't even know why. say I it. I don't know. Why. And I just said like focus on the good old times, and they just said nothing, and then said Erica Lalon, and I was like, oh. I am her nephew. <laughs> I was scared. She's like shaking my hand. And she's like, you know Tammy? You know Tammy? And I'm like, e- nephew? And then she's like, what? You're just nervous right now. And I'm like, yeah. uh, okay. Oh, and right. then, yeah, that's the finished mural. Yeah. Um, now, this is what I, I saw tweeted on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Erica Lalonde won. <laughs> Very cool. I know you've been working on that for some time, right? Yeah, it was two and a half months. Um, and I don't know, it's it's nice because we don't have anything in our school like that. Like That's the first time in 10 years that we actually have art of some mm. sort, kind of just bringing in some, like, I don't know, some nice, colorful, joyful feelings rather than a white kind of, right. you know, the blemish school. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, well done. And congratulations on the graduation. Glad you're having a good summer. So. Yeah, it's going really good. How's your summer going? It's nice to see everybody. Thanks for joining us in the chat room. Category 5 on uh, Freenode. And you can visit our website, www.category5.tv. And then also, coming up in the showroom, or in the newsroom, sorry, Apple has been has dealt an interesting in-your-face blow to the benefit of Samsung. Linux kernel 3.5 is now available, and Microsoft made a loss for the first time since it joined the stock market in 1986. Wow. Also, want to transfer data in bird songs? There's now an app for that, so stick around for these stories that are coming up later in the show. Whew. <laughs> We've got your viewer questions tonight. You can email us live at category5.tv. Again, join us in the chat room. We're going to do our best to uh, keep up with you there. Nice to see Chris Reich and Jot Agamoto, Garby, who uh, joins us quite often through the week as well, GWG, A. Jameson. Uh, we've got tons of you. And also, Math Man, nice to see you. Yeah, thanks for the uh, belated birthdays. And yeah, I know it's kind of hard. I, no one really knew about it, but whatever. It's okay. But we have a viewer question from cool. Shas Lennox. From hey, Shas Lennox. Kitchener. Um, so Robbie installed Lubuntu on my IBM ThinkPad uh, T23. Okay. It can't seem to get the flash working under the Chromium or Firefox. Um, installed Ubuntu restricted extras. Manually installed flash as per uh, Adobe. Think the problem is the hardware since I've done this a lot. Flash video just got back on Firefox on Chrome and it says it's missing a plugin. But both work fine on my leave. Lenovo 3000? Uh, Lenovo? Le- uh, like IBM? Lenovo? Yeah. Brand. Yeah, okay. Uh, C100. Using same install process. Reinstalled regular Ubuntu, same problems. Do you think that the low end video card in the laptop might be causing the flash problems? Mm-hmm. It can. Uh, what I'm looking at here is I've just brought up um, YouTube. I should probably go to something that I know is safe, which is Category 5 TV. And you'll see, you know, when I when I launch a YouTube video, for example, just because this taps into Flash, so it's a good idea to test. If I right-click on it and go uh, Settings, you'll notice that there's something here that I've got turned off there, Chas Linux, and it's Enable Hardware Acceleration. In Linux, under certain situations with certain drivers and graphics and things, that checkbox can cause some very strange anomalies that uh, that will, in fact, break your Flash for, for video playback. So I'm not sure if that's necessarily what, it it could very well be what the problem is. That would be the first thing that I would check with regard to uh, the modern Flash. Also, um, there have been some known issues with, uh, I think, version 11, um, the the latest version anyways, since upgrading. And uh, so you might try, if if absolutely everything else fails, you might try reverting to a slightly older version. Uh, Flash from version to version tends to be fairly similar these days so you know if if the latest and greatest doesn't work for you then you can step back just a little bit but try turning off that hardware acceleration in the settings first and foremost just bring up the video right click on it go settings and disable that that will uh, that will hopefully bring it back for you that fixed it for me Uh, I was getting uh, black windows for for flash videos and some pink you know the faces would come in and it would look all pink and blocky so Mm -hmm. it was very strange 
I hope that helps for you. Erica, we have to take a quick break, and, uh, and we're going to be back with more viewer questions after the break, but stick around. Uh, and, of course, we're going to be looking at that app. We're going to be looking at tonight. We're going to be talking about backups, and uh, I may even have something really kind of cool to show you if we have time. So stick around. Awesome. We're going to be right back after this. <laughs> At EcoAlkalines, we believe you should be able to trust your batteries not just here, but here, here, and here. But with one exception, you should also be able to trust your batteries here. EcoAlkalines are the world's first and only certified carbon neutral battery manufactured to the highest standards of recycling and quality, without any trace amounts of harmful chemicals like mercury, lead, or cadmium. EcoAlkalines provide performance that rivals leading national alkaline battery brands at a comparable price. Find out more about the EcoAlkalines difference. EcoAlkalines.com <laughs> this is Category 5 Technology TV. We're online at www.category5.tv. And, of course, our mobile site is m.cat5.tv. And Category 5 TV is also a member of the Tech Podcast Network. And if it's tech, it's here. And the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. Now I just looked at the uh, fee, uh, like the type-in feed. and the chat room there? Yeah, in the chat room. What's going on, folks? <laughs> I love the comment by uh, Agamemoto. Is that how you call it? Agamemoto. Agamemoto. Yeah. Uh, about your shirt blowing out the color filters. <laughs> oh, did I? Whoa! I that said, was the first comment. What was when the we first, first thing I said in. to you? Yeah. You, whoa! Look at your shirt. And I said, "Well, this is this is me clinging desperately onto my youth." So that's take it or leave it. Whatever. You go on backstage pass can read the back, perhaps. If you're on backstage pass. <laughs> well, I don't know. I was thinking plaid, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. it's plaid in. It's always... We're we're totally hip and styling today. We're now, yours totally is kind of like red and blue, so if yeah. I had my 3D glasses, it'd be, whoa, <laughs> trippy. It'd be like a scene from Tron or something. <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, we have another question from Garvey. Hey, Garvey. So, hello, guys. Um, I was watching the episode uh, 250. 250 and when Robbie was explaining a virtual box setup to uh, emulate a network setup, Eric was trying to think of something that would need to be changed between the clones uh, for them to be unique. I think oh, yeah. he was trying to come up with a host name. The host name for a system must also be unique on a network. Uh, virtual box itself should manage the MAC address so they will be unique. But the host name would remain the same and should be changed in order to run many copies of a system on a network. Right. Thanks, Garby. Yes. Oh, I wish Eric was here to hear that because a couple weeks ago when Eric was here, mm -hmm. he was trying to explain host name. And you're absolutely right. That's exactly what he was going for. And uh, I was thinking MAC address. He wasn't explaining it. He was saying SID which made me think about Wi-Fi with SSIDs and stuff. So, yes. Host name. That is your identity on the network. So if you if you clone a virtual machine, for example, you've got Windows 7 installed in a virtual machine, and you make a copy of that machine, we I was trying to grasp what Eric was saying. I, I was saying, oh, you need to change the UUID of that virtual hard drive, obviously, uh, because otherwise it's going to think that it's two of the exact same hard drive, and it's going to conflict. Um, but what he was saying is, you know, once you've booted it up, you need to change the host name so that they can both run on the same network, otherwise you're going to have that host name conflict. So DNS won't work properly and stuff like that. So, Cool, yeah. thanks Garby. <laughs> um, well, we have another question. Um, this is more request at the moment rather than a question. Okay. Um, but I'm sure it's been covered before. So, would it be possible to show our series of shows that goes on um, goes into the principles of networking, i.e., what IP addresses are in, uh, internal, external, and how to find your uh, internal, external IP. Uh, what a network gateway is, um, how to port forward mm. ports, etc. Something that is targeted towards beginners who wish to get into networking. Yeah. If this is not possible, could you direct me to sites that are targeted mm. to beginners? That that's uh, a question vast question from Robert. Thanks, Robert. Um, it's a pretty vast yeah. thing to say. You know, can you cover this in in the course of a question? And I and I understand from the beginning of your email that you and you you get that that would 
take up a whole show practically to get into. I wouldn't mind uh, knowing a little bit more about where you're at and what what kind of things you're hoping to do. Networking is is something that's great to know because the things that you can do are just limitless. I mean, if you want, you can. If you understand networking well enough, you can be. You can optimize the way that your backups are done. Um, I've got a pogo plug sitting at work, for example, so that my backups can just be done to the pogo plug, and my server that's here thinks that the pogo plug is another computer on our network. So it's you know it's knowing how to do networking, and it's it's it can be fairly basic. It can be quite advanced, and when you understand things like host name, as Garby says. <laughs> then you're you're flying, but let let me know, Robert. What uh, I guess where you, it's tough. That's that's such a wide wide <laughs> thing. That's like it's almost like saying like, can you can you tell us about audio? Like it's it's that it's that a wide very, of a yeah. spectrum. There's so much stuff that that we could get into, and you know we're talking IP addresses. Okay, so we're looking at multiple levels of IP. You're probably using IPv4. Um, we probably need to get into IPv6 at the same time, different versions of the IP addresses. Um, but yeah, let's <laughs> let's let's chip away at it. Let's. So let me know what uh, what specifically you want to, what you want to learn how to do. Might help me to to grasp what it is that you're hoping for. Be happy to help. <laughs> Thanks. Well, we have tons of questions tonight, so let's try to get through them all. Um, okay. We have one, another one from Swiss and I, and so it says in Linux, one of the more discouraging um, peculiarities is the process of installing software that doesn't come via uh, the respiratory in oh, Windows. Oh, the repositories. Yeah, repository. Yeah. Sorry, in Windows, all we have to do is start the setup, etc., and, and um, answer a few questions to get things started in a few seconds. But to a uh, below geeky Linux user like me, installing often comes as a rather lengthy and frustrating process. Hmm. Yeah, well, what, what they're saying there, and, and I, I thought it was interesting off the top, Erica read your name as Swiss and I, because it's, it's, that's how it's spelled exactly. I've always said Swiss Andy. Oh, but isn't it, that's so funny how two different people can read it two different ways? That's just how I've read it. So let us know which is the correct pronunciation, and whoever got it right will win a prize. <laughs> I hope it's me. I hope it's me. Uh, I'm going to say Swiss Andy just because that's what I've always said. Um, using a repository in Linux is is the the dreamiest way to install programs on your computer. I'll show you, Erica, what uh, what a repository is is capable of. I'll just bring one. I'm going to bring up Synaptic Package Manager on my computer, which is basically a program that you can use to install programs on your Linux computer. And I say this as if you know, I, I really I want you to I want you to switch to Linux, okay? I so did, but I had issues installing. You need to talk to me about these. Bring it in. Let's I get it on the show. Okay, for the next month, I have no internet. At the That's Delaware unreasonable. In any time I come back, I have like a hundred new messages that I have to read because yeah. I've only been back twice now, and I've been there for a week, but I had to go to my orientation. So if if I email you and it takes you six months to get back to me, I'll know why. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> no, gotcha. no, no. I'll be back All before right. September. <laughs> check out check out what a repository does here. <laughs> so here are the repositories. So you see that you know I'm subscribed to the main, the universe, the restricted, the multiverse. Each one has different kinds of software. Main is essentially, you know, the the free open source stuff. Universe is kind of out there stuff. Restricted could be stuff that is considered possibly not legal in certain countries and things like that. MP3 codecs and stuff like that. It's, it's wide what you can do. So with the repository, Erica, uh, what you can do is type in the name of a program. Last week we were looking at uh, key pass x for example and so we installed that just by clicking mark for installation and go so with a repository installations on linux are so easy and i think that's what swiss andy is saying on windows though you typically download a setup.exe file you run it it works what uh, you know is there an equivalent to that in linux and t usually there is and and usually that is comes in the form of an rpm or in our case, using a Debian-based distribution, we're going to have um, DEB packages. 
DEB packages are, are for the Debian package manager, and they, they will open on your computer. If you're using Ubuntu, they'll open in Ubuntu Software Center, and there will just be a button that says Install, and it will actually show you a screenshot. It will let you do it all that way. So look for DEB packages. Okay. Um, I think Swiss Andy was going on to talk about um, the yeah. what pulse. Um, and so I, want, I thought, you know, let's take a look at this and see what's... What's up? Well, he said for a recent example, the Linux version of the What Pulse application. Um, all I want to do is install it in Ubuntu uh, twelve point four uh, or similar and make it start automatically at boot time. But it seems to, it seems I'm even too dumb oh. to install. Oh, don't say that. No, it's nothing like that. It's, it, it can be complex, and, and it's a learning curve, right? Everything yeah. is a learning curve. Hey, I had issues installing it as well, so... Yeah, and, and it's <laughs> always, like, when you're used to Windows, as the example, because you're used to being able to click on a setup.exe, you, you are going to think along that that way, mm -hmm. right? If you're used to doing it this way, if you always drive on the right-hand side of the road and you go somewhere where they're driving on the left, it seems weird, and it seems difficult and challenging. So now I've just brought up What Pulse on their website. So this is whatpulse.org. Now our What Pulse team is cat5.tv slash pulse. That will take you to our actual team. So you'll be able to participate in that once you get this installed. So I've clicked on the download of version 1.232 bit. I didn't bother with this setup script. Um, maybe I will need to. Let's take a look. Keep. Yes. Ah, uh, yes, I do need that. Yeah, see, they don't really outline. Okay, so let me explain to you what's going on here. See, I, can, I understand <laughs> this stuff, so, I, you know, we take it for granted. And maybe that's what it is. Somebody who designed this website is somebody who understands all this stuff. And I'm sorry that they're not giving you every, all the information <laughs> that you need. Download both of those things, okay? Because the setup script is actually, if we look at it, it's actually a, a, a script that's going to set up the permissions for your kernel. Because the thing is, is that what Pulse basically taps into your keyboard driver at the kernel, <laughs> kernel level so that you're able to um, run what Pulse and it's able to track your keystrokes. It doesn't track any of the, the words that you type or anything like that. It simply tracks the, the number of times that I click mm -hmm. the letter F, for example. So you'll notice if I open that file, setup permissions.sh, it's just a it's a Bosch script. It's just goes through, no problem. So what I'm gonna do, or a shell script or whatever, there we go. I'm gonna go to terminal. I'm gonna show you how to do this. So we've got that setup permissions.sh. We're gonna go into the folder where I downloaded <coughs> it to. Sorry, I'm gonna go into the folder Sorry. where I downloaded it to. There we are. And oh no, that's not it. CD downloads, and the there we go. I'm there. <laughs> downloads plural. Perfect. The file name is setup-permissions.sh. So the first thing that I need to do, this is what they're not telling you. Under once we understand what <laughs> what these files are, and I'm really just showing you how to do what pulse because it shouldn't be overly complicated. But what pulse is a script. It's not really a program that you're installing like a Windows program. It's just a script that's running on your computer. Linux is a is a whole different can of worms when it comes to that kind of stuff because you can create, like basically what Windows had as bat files, you can do entire applications uh, based on the same kind of premise, just creating a text file. And that's what they've done here with WebPulse. So knowing that, okay, this file needs to be executable, See, watch what happens if I go dot slash, okay, because I'm running a, a, a current folder file. I need to go dot slash, and then the file name is setup-permissions, setup-permissions.sh. If I try to run it, it says permission denied. The reason for that is because I've downloaded this in my computer to protect me. Linux has said this is not an executable program unless you tell it that I'm allowed to execute it. So I'm going to do that now. I'm going to do it through the terminal so that you learn a little bit better. You can right-click on it in uh, in Nautilus or your your My Computer folder browsing kind of thing in, in uh, your GUI and just go Properties and run it as a program. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go CH mod plus X setup and, and just hit Tab. Now what I'm doing is I'm adding the executable bit to that program. So now when I run it, it's actually going to go. See that? So that 
that's being output now is in fact the first line of the script. It's being echoed to my terminal window. So now if I r run it, what it's going to do is it's going to allow my system to, uh, to get the permissions. Now it's telling me here that it needs to be root. So what we need to do is go sudo dot slash set tab and that does the setup permissions dot sh. Run that now, it's going to ask you for a password. sudo now is going to allow this to run as root, which means basically it has administrator access. Again, to protect you, you from malicious software and things, Linux is, is very strict, so it will not run things as the administrator unless you force them to. That's where sudo comes in. So now I'm going to hit return, and I've obviously already run this, so you'll be able to go through that step and be able to run that no problem, okay? So the next step is we've got that file here, and what on earth do you do with that? Where's the executable? Where's the et cetera, et cetera? But again, realizing that this is, in fact, strictly a script. Let's see what it actually looks like. Maybe it's not a shell script. Maybe it's something else. Who knows? Let's take a look. CD dot dot slash desktop. There's my what pulse file. I'm going to again chmod plus x what pulse because I'm telling it it is executable and it is case sensitive. So capital W, capital P. What pulse? Enter. Okay, so you can see now it runs. <laughs> and you get all that kind of stuff. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. yeah I, I might actually fail to load. Let's try sudo dot slash what pulse. Ah, I got to run it as sudo. There you go. Now it's monitoring. All right, so now you can see it's actually running on my system. Grand. There it is. Boom. See that? <laughs> so all that to get you there. <laughs> so I totally feel for you. I totally understand. But know that you can see that once you get that it's really just a script. It's mm -hmm. not even a program. And you got to just set it as executable and run it. And you got to run it as super user. I think, you know, when, when you're on Windows, you can double click on something and it can do anything to your system. And mm -hmm. that's ease of use. But at the same time, it's very, very dangerous. Because you can change up something. Oh, they don't how many computers come in for service that somebody clicked OK on the wrong thing, like which, <laughs> you know, you did on Twitter. And it happens. You get so many prompts day in, day out. Yeah. OK, 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 OK. <laughs> leave me. Where's the leave me alone button? And you're just pushing them and, and it does it because it yeah. has the access oh, exactly. to do that. Exactly. You're telling people on the Internet, is it OK to do this? Is it OK to do that? Mm. Okay. And you just kind of at that point, you start okay, to say, okay, OK, OK, OK. Yeah, leave me alone. <laughs> And, and then, then you're, you're like, why is my screen not popping up? Yeah. Oh, why I okay. Why are all my files gone? <laughs> yeah. So you can see there that it's not, it's not overly complex once you get it as far as the concepts behind it. Mm -hmm. but, but it would have been nice if on the What Pulse page if they had shown you how to do that for or sure. Or a little helpline. Yeah. <laughs> for, yeah, I'm in the same position. In, in <laughs> typical scenarios, look for a DEB package. They're easy breezy because you just double click on them just like a setup.exe brilliant and they also take care of dependencies where running something in the terminal doesn't always a Debian package will install what that means is if 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 in order to install this program and use it I have to have this program a deb package or, uh, primarily a, a repository package as well will go out to the repositories download the necessary programs and install them for you automatically so you don't need to go out and find those additional things Repositories are the best way to do it because using a repository means as new versions of the software come out, you're going to automatically get the brand new version of that software. Unlike Windows updates, which typically only updates the operating system and Microsoft specific products like Office, the repository is anything that you install. If I install any program whatsoever, if they bring out a new version and release it in, in the repositories, I will get that update. So all of my stuff stays up to date. If you use a Debian package or if you use scripts like this, you're going to have to manually update them as you go because it doesn't know where you got those from. So stick to the repositories if you can. Cool? Awesome. Well. Thanks for all your questions. We'll come back with more questions after the news, I think, because we do have a ton of your questions to, to address. Oh, yes. 
But Thanks, here in the top stories from the Category 5 newsroom, um, a UK judge has ordered Apple to publish announcements that Samsung did not copy the design of its iPad. According to Bloomberg a News Agency, it said that it said the judge said one notice should uh, remain app- uh, on Apple's website for at least six months, while other adverts should be placed in various newspapers and magazines. It follows the U.S. company's failed attempt to block sales wow. of the South Korean firm's Galaxy Tab tablets. At the time of the story was written, Apple had not commented on the news. That sounds like it would be embarrassing for a company that they li- <laughs> they have to make commercials that say... No, they didn't copy us. That's that doesn't look too good. But they'll probably no. find some. They're Apple, right? They'll they're, find some they'll kind of find cool. Spam. They'll get some cool guy in a leather jacket <laughs> to be like, it's oh. leather. <laughs> yeah, you know, and he'll he'll make it seem suave that they took and make it very Samsung to court. Very, or hip in a way yeah. of that. <laughs> You know, yeah. Apple better than Microsoft kind of thing. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Huh. <laughs> well, uh, Lennis um, Torvalds proudly announced on Saturday the immediate availability of Linux kernel 3.5. The new version of the kernel brings support for some new hardware, plus various interesting features such as the support for uh, meta database checksums in the AXT4 file system, and improvements such as memory management fixes, networking and virtualizations, security, and a ton more. Nice. Is it just me, or is it a nice thing that it is not version 3.4.3.26.8.3 i386.7? 3.5, it is. Thank you, 3.5. Mr. Torvalds. <laughs> and Microsoft has made the first quarterly loss in, in history after it wrote off um, of the value of its online advertising business. The loss came after it wrote down the value of... Um, it a qualitative by 6.2 billion, um, which failed to bring the profits expected by Microsoft. Um, that led to a f- uh, 492 million loss in the three months to the end of June, compared with a profit of 5.9 billion a year ago. Uh, the company has not made a loss since it joined the stock market in 1986. It took over a a quantive in 2007, but it struggled to compete with rival Google. Microsoft is doing well in other areas despite the decline in popularity of its micro- uh, Windows operating system, which dominated the personal computer market for many years. Hmm. But you can see that in today, like a lot of people aren't always going for Microsoft. You know, like I find that very cool. Like we don't write these news stories; these these come to us, and that's actually from BBC. And the fact that uh, that they say, despite the decline in popularity of its Windows operating system, I think that that is is a sign right there. But mm-hmm. yeah, there's there's there are so many alternatives now, Oops. with Linux being kind of at the forefront, and Mac if you if you really want to switch hardware too. Well, Mac, like a Mac, I find even is for people my age. Like when I talk about when I talked about installing Linux as mm-hmm. an operating system, people were like, "Is that the little penguin sign?" <laughs> and I'm like, that I, that I saw like when I was like a five, like, I don't know, like five years ago or something in a store. And I'm like, no, it's not in a store. Like you, it's free. Like you can get it online. And like I just gotta learn how to use it. But there you go. <laughs> gotta learn how to install what pulse. <laughs> gotta learn how to use now it. Now you know. Yeah. <laughs> but no, like I, I definitely noticed that Apple, like as marketing towards you know people my age and. They're now switching mm. from Microsoft to Apple because it's it, like we have iPods. Like all my friends talk about is their iPod, iPhone, and mm. that connects to their now iPad or their you know their iMac or <laughs> iBook. So there you go. <laughs> you got all the teenagers in the world. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. But anyways, <laughs> well, there's now a new app that trim that. Um, transmits data um, that a burst of a data uh, bird song it aims to simplify the way users share images and other files between smartphones uh, chirp 
A chirp plays a two-second long noise that sounds as if it was made by a, ro a robotic bird. When heard by other devices, it triggers a download. The software, which is free to use, was developed by Animal Systems, a spin-off business from the University College of London. Interesting. I, I had to find out more about chirp. Thank you for for doing the news. <laughs> no problem. Fantastic. You can find <laughs> out more about the newsroom at newsroom.category5.tv. I'll hand you this. I've installed Chirp on this, okay. the iPad, and it's it's strictly available for iOS right now. So iPods, iPhones, iPads. I would think that as the popularity increases, though, we'll probably see other platforms too. Mm -hmm. You think about a room full of people all with their iPhones and whatever, and, and Chirp will just run in the background and no problem because there is multitasking on the iDevices now, mm -hmm. as you know. They, they introduced that because it, it's, it's probably a good thing. So now I've brought it up here. You've got it up there. I don't know if you can show the folks at home what it looks like. Well, it's kind of hard to see, but just a general kind yeah. of profile of what it's going to look like. Okay, so uh, hold that up. I'm I'm just simply going to chirp, and if you've got this installed at home, feel free to, you know, turn on your your hey. iPhone or whatever. So we're not connected by Bluetooth. No. We're not connected by Wi-Fi. We're not connected by any kind of cables or, you know, we we don't have to bang our devices together. If you're in a room and and ten people have chirp installed, the theory is that it's going to everybody's going to receive that chirp. That's moment, cool. Moment of truth. Moment of truth. You ready? Okay, let's see. Okay, here we go. <laughs> That's cool. Wow. Did, did you guys hear that? And it picked it up again. It picked it so up. So now tap the, the world, which receives the... There you go. And open in Safari. And so what I've actually just done... Is you sent me the Category 5... Uh, Mm -hmm. Here it comes. Got it. Got it. Look oh, at that. Show, cool. show them. Look at that. <laughs> That's chirp. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a neat idea, is it not? That is. It just it's something you think of in your head. It'd be so easy. It's it brings subliminal messages to a whole new level. Cool. That is anyway, very that's, cool. That's available for free in the App Store for your iDevice. And uh, give it a try. I mean, rewind the video and in install it on your uh, your iDevice and uh, push play. I definitely would. If I had an iDevice, I'd be yeah. using that. Better than there Bump you. and all but that. But it actually works. Like, sometimes yeah. we get these kind of weird new things and That doesn't that's cool. work. Now, now, I wonder what kind of the range is. Like, how, how well does this... They would have to test that, you'd think. Let's bring up Chirp again Let's there. Let's bring up Chirp. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, like, I'm going to go way over here. No. And it picked it up? It still picked it up. It still picked it up. We'll have That's to, cool. We'll have to maybe do a test and see how the range like, works. Stand like, way over there. It's pretty high frequency, so I'll bet your range is pretty good. Like, chirp and then see if like someone outside can get it. Yeah. Hold, hold the iPad up over there. Okay. And we'll, we'll go from the, this okay. room as far as it, okay, as far to as the can. end of both rooms. Oh, still got it. Wow. There's a good, you know... 200 feet there. <laughs> <laughs> cool. That's Chirp. Get it from the uh, the uh, iTunes store. There you go. That's Category awesome. 5 Technology TV is brought to you tonight by Cordery Electric. They're the official electrical sponsor of Category 5 TV. You can find out more about them at CorderyElectric.com. Also, we've got one month free trials for you of Netflix. Go to cat5.tv slash Netflix. That's going to give you all the movies you can watch absolutely free for one month. And once you're done, it's it's eight bucks a month. I, l I actually, I don't know, like, um, I've been using it now for a month, and I just love it. Like, whenever, like, spare time, I can actually watch the shows I want to watch. Like, yeah. not have to go on TV. I'm finding new old shows that I didn't know existed. Like uh, sliders, sliders, and uh, Mr. D. Mr. D no, never Hilarious. watched it. 
I'm watching Dead Like Me. I just finished it. Okay. I used to watch that show. It was about like Grim Reapers living See, among us. We have us. very opposite <laughs> loves for types of TV shows. <laughs> yeah, I, I watched Dead Like Me, Arrested Development, brought Arrested those. Development definitely, but we'd oh. already seen that. I so know, it, it because we've already seen it. I haven't seen it. Like like my friend showed it to me the first time, and I'm like, "What is this? I had I not watched this before." <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious, and they're bringing out more. There's really? another season coming out, yes. and a movie following the season. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> as long as they do a great job, because the, the people have done that before, where they've canceled a show and then ten years later they bring out a. A follow-up, yes. and, it's, and it's a bomb. But I'm sure they'll do really well. It was a good cast. Anyway, Hopefully. we digress. We digress. <laughs> I, I like Tobias. He's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, we actually do have a Netflix uh, question. Oh, yeah? Um, we got one from Jib Bob Media. And um, it says... Jim Bob! <laughs> I'm using Netflix, and I've been a member for a year now. As you probably know, Canadians have a different selection to choose from than the U.S. Yes, I realize that as well. Um, I came across a site that allows members in Canada the same uh, selections as a U.S. on Netflix using their server. They say it's not a VPN and supposedly fast. I tried it for a free seven-day trial, and it was... Im- and I was impressed with the speed, but I have fiber cable as well. So I was um, I was able to receive Netflix uh, US on my smart TV upgrade box and a lot more services on my uh, WD Live box, but I'd like to get your opinion on the mm. service. Yeah, the, the, the tricky thing with that kind of stuff is that it is kind of a gray area as far as legal-wise. I'm not sure why... Netflix Canada has different programming than Netflix US, Mm -hmm. but I would expect that it has to do with copyright laws or something uh, of that sort. So with with these kind of services, as you say, they say they're not a VPN, but usually it's done through a VPN kind of tunneling or something like that. Um, With those types of services, typically, you know, if you're traveling, then it's a different kind of thing because you're you own the service let's say you own it in the United States and you travel to Canada and you you want to still be able to watch your shows, that's one thing. But if you live in Canada, you don't have a United States address, do you have the legal right to watch a service that is legally only available in the United States? So it would I, I would think that would specifically be a question probably for Netflix, mm-hmm. which you can contact them by email, uh, not by email, by phone off of their website. Uh, and again, it's right on cat5.tv slash Netflix. You'd probably ask them if there's a legal issue there. But it, again, it's a gray area because the the modern web has progressed faster than the uh, the copyrights and the way that things are copyrighted in, in today's modern internet. So I think that has something to do with it. So Yeah, and for, and for a reason why it's different, I know, like I know the US Netflix has a lot more selections yeah, but a, a lot of the the companies that are creating this content are yeah. are From American, the, right? Yeah. So are they saying no? We won't allow it to be distributed in Canada. And so then, if you're tapping into a service that allows you access to that, you're 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 maybe not necessarily breaking the law, but it's possible that the service that is providing that may be on on the verge or kind of on that line of maybe they're stepping in somewhere that is is a little bit past the gray area so it's hard to say but i mean those services can work absolutely Mm -hmm. if you want my technical opinion they can certainly work i think they're a cool idea and but i think it would be really great if if the world wide web was a world wide web but it's kind of like you know your cable tv is different in the states versus canada too right so Mm -hmm. take it for what it is i got three channels in my room Awesome. <laughs> and no internet, so you can't install Netflix. That's no. tragic and that, sad. Like, that was the thing. Like, I didn't bring a single movie. Yeah. I did. I thought when I'd get up there, I'd tap into their internet, because like, that's usually what you do. <laughs> Tapped yeah. into their internet, opened up Google, saw a re- re- reload page. Okay, Netflix. And it's not. <laughs> go, go on Netflix. Saw a re- reload page. Okay. No Wi-Fi signals nearby or anything? Like, they say they have it, but it doesn't work. People brought their Xboxes. People oh, are man. trying to get on the live, and, like, we're all trying to game and stuff. But yeah. no, and I don't clean out houses, good guy. 
I prep food. <laughs> Those two don't mix well. <laughs> That's for housekeeping, and I feel bad for them. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> but um, no, like I don't know. It, it, it'd be nice. So I came back and grabbed like a hundred different movies that I could possibly find. But it's hard when. I had Netflix and I just had everything there. I, I honestly mm -hmm. pre-planned, wrote everything down hmm. what I'm gonna watch. So. Yeah, that's tough. I could send you some VHS. I think my mic, my mic just went out. Did it? Are you good? Is it better now? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Can, can you can you can you hear me now? <laughs> Only I'm Erica. Sorry. Only Erica. <laughs> can you hear me now? <laughs> I still do that. <laughs> it's, it's still an old phone. Yeah. <laughs> I know I got asked like a million times. iPhone, I, smartphone. No. <laughs> T9, that's what's up. Yeah, where, Garvey <laughs> says, where are the Cat 5 bars? Have we got three bars or four bars? Signal's good. Signal's good. You can s see that. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Good. So signal's right. good. Very good. I'm not very good with out of my peripherals. <laughs> <laughs> what are what are you doing uh, now? You've got a laptop computer. Mm -hmm. We've talked about before. What are you doing for your backups? And be honest with me. If you're not doing anything, then I actually I have a little hard drive, and I've just been kind of putting it on there. Mm -hmm. But and how do you put it on there? I've just been copying and saving my files. Good. Um. Mostly just my music, my photos, a lot of the stuff that I've been doing on my computer. Um, I've had, I've managed to actually restore the last four years of high school because I, I lost a lot of my files and stuff that I did mm. when my old laptop kind of fried on me. But now I have like from grade 9 to grade 12, I can look at, at the projects I've done and I'm able to, I don't know, it's just like a little mini one. But other than mm. that, I haven't really had the time to look into anything else as okay. well of backing up. I had, uh, I mean, I see people coming in all the time with failed hard drives and things like that. And, and a particular gentleman came in this week who had purchased an external hard drive, one of those mini mm -hmm. external hard drives, and had in fact been clearing the files off of his laptop onto that hard drive so it's only it's oh, only there mine doesn't do that though so you're running a particular program that actually runs a, a real backup we've looked at some here on the show like the click free device for example uh, which are fantastic for for that but mm -hmm. if you buy typically when you buy a piece of hardware like that an external hard drive it's it is just a hard drive you plug it in and it just comes up and it's got yeah. a, its own drive letter and you're good to go so people and i see it all the time take their photos and drag it onto that and move them so what happens then, and, and unfortunately what happened to this, this guy, is that, I mean, we live in a digital age. You've got digital cameras. I use digital video cameras. All of our f family videos, my kids, the birthday parties that they've had and everything are all stored on, like, these kind of deals. Yeah. You know? So then I import them. What do I do with them? Do I put them on my computer and then move them onto this drive? Put them on both. Unfortunately, this guy had been moving them off of his laptop thinking, well, I need that space to import more. So I'm moving it onto this external hard drive, and then the hard drive crashed. And, of course, that means all of his digital photos of him and his family and, and you know, possibly loved ones that have, have moved on and, and that, you know, those photos are priceless. Mm -hmm. You can't recreate that stuff. And... Uh, that was the one place that it was, was on this external hard drive. So if you get one of these hard drives, the important thing to understand is that a backup is not moving your files onto another medium. It's simply just making yeah. a second copy. It's having redundancy, always having multiple copies. This guy said, well, can I not just get a particular external hard drive that, like, isn't there a brand that doesn't fail? Like, do they all, like, are they all junk? No, it's you never know. Like that's the thing. My laptop, you never know when it's just gonna stop working one day. One of the guys at work, his his <laughs> famous line is, "It's not if, it's when." Yeah. It's it's going to happen. Your hard drive is going to crash. 
if your hard drive crashes tonight, it's not my fault. <laughs> we did we did not try yeah. to you know spook anybody out, but it just it happened. I do want to spook people though because I yeah. want it, it's going to happen. When is it going to happen? You have no idea. So this guy has moved all of his files over, and then hard drive crashes, and he's lost everything. All of his digital videos, all of his digital pictures, music. Who cares? I mean, he can get the music again, but all of the priceless stuff that you can't get again no. is is technically gone like i don't like all my little funky little projects i did on my last laptop or just like scripts ideas anything you want to mm-hmm. type down like i lost most of it i could only like literally get i only got probably two gigs out of 60 of what i had filled on there right at the time which was a lot but not mm-hmm. anymore <laughs> Mathman 47, Math 47 in the chat room says that a raid one is always backed up and, and so that's another mindset, math man, that is eh, sort of. Let me give you a scenario. RAID 1 is basically when you have two hard drives or more, and they're always duplicates of each other. So if I save a file, I now have it on two hard drives. So if one hard drive crashes, I have it on another hard drive. Is that a backup? No. That's the same. It's redundancy, which is a good thing. But what happens if you have a fire? What happens in a case like that? Or what happens if you get hit by a power surge? I've had that happen. You know that we had some times here uh, where we had some power surges yeah. and we lost some hardware. And it's not selective as to which of your two hard drives go. Um, good guy mentioning in the in the chat room, what about robbers? We had somebody break into the studio and steal a whole bunch of stuff. What if our RAID 1 set was part of that? It's not technically a backup. It's a fail-safe as far as, in business, a RAID 1 is great because if a hard drive fails, you're, you're still up and running. You, your server doesn't stop working. It keeps going off the other hard drive. You re- replace that hard drive, and it rebuilds the set. But it's not something that you're taking off-site. It's not something that is an actual backup. A backup is, not, is, is, is redundancy, obviously, but it's redundancy that is separate from your existing system. If it's an external hard drive, it means you're unplugging it and putting it away, putting it in a safety deposit box, getting it somewhere else, sta- saving it at a family member's house, um, but definitely getting it unplugged because I think of power surges. And if it's plugged into USB in the same server that gets fried, or computer, if your computer gets fried in a power surge and then uh, your hard drive is attached to it, guess what? So. And that's also another thing. Like You could have your hard drive attached to your laptop, but it's good to have that maybe hard drive put away in an old laptop box or something of just mm-hmm. all of your older pictures. Like buy a hard drive to like as like once it's filled up. Well, if it's a terabyte or something. But yeah, it takes a while. <laughs> it takes a while. When it's your backup, it's not everything. It's just the key. <laughs> and yeah, like to it's your just the key. Like you could have like years. I don't know, like the first years of your life to I uh, like the middle part, just all all Drive on one. one. Is my first ten years. <laughs> First 10 I like years. the idea of a safety deposit box, or yeah. if, if you have an office at work and you've got a locking drawer or something, stick it in there and, na- and get it off site. Because now that you know photo albums are slowly disappearing, mm-hmm. that you know I still have them, but in the next generations, like they're not going to have as many photo albums unless you're actually going right. to a Walmart to get it printed, to get the photos printed. Like, like a safety deposit box for one of those is like it's it's the definitely necessary. If you want to keep those memories, at least, if your anything happens to your computer room, flood anything, like you never know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, what do you do at home uh, with regards to your backups, and are you keeping a redundant backup? That's the question tonight. Um, I want to know, and 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 I want you to have the confidence that you have copies of your stuff in two places at once, a minimum two places. Flash drives, you know, the USB drives, mm-hmm. are very unreliable. Those kind of things, they are good for transferring stuff back and forth from your computer to your laptop. And I've never even used it as a backup one. You can't. Don't no. ever use it as a backup. Don't, don't store anything on those things um, because they fail. And they fail hard, and you can't get your data off of them if they do in most cases. So... Um, and then there's, you know, I've seen it's been plugged into the computer and the cleaning person came through 
like this and snapped the USB right off. And really? it, you know, stuff happens, right? So like I, I remember sure. at school, like you, you would even plug them in and then it, it, a little screen would pop up saying they had to do a virus check because yeah. people were putting viruses in the school. Brilliant. And then they were <laughs> just people would just, you know. I would never do a thing like that. <laughs> Let, let's plug in a virus. <laughs> Some good county school system. <laughs> Jot is using Unraid, uh, but no external backup, no place to store it. I would suggest, now, Unraid is, is a redundant solution. Mm-hmm. You've got single drive failure protection. And if more than one drive fails, you only lose the data on one hard drive. So that's pretty decent. Yeah. And that's what I use as my system here. But then I've also taken it one step further, and I've thrown a pogo plug across town and put it somewhere. And I back up my stuff over the Internet on a regular basis so I always have a, a redundant copy if that's not an option for you um, and usually you can you know you might be able to find a friend or something that that you could swap you know install a pogo plug at their place and offer to let them back up their stuff to your server for example just encrypt it on its way over and you're good to go um, there are ways to get your stuff in other places but jot I would suggest that you get into a, a scenario if you're using on raid you're obviously you've got a fair bit of data um, get yourself even if it needs to be just a single hard drive you can buy three terabyte hard drives now external drives for you know the price is going down mm-hmm. it was very very high there for a while but uh, things are getting better um, since you know supply and demand is kind of shifting so um, but get into a scenario where you've got redundancy um, beyond just the system itself. Make sure you've got something that you can take away. Yeah, for sure. One uh, one viewer in the chat room, and I didn't catch their name, was mentioning about using the cloud. Yes, to do their I, I was looking at that as well. And and that's fine too. But again, I've now, never used it before. And what the cloud is? I mean, the cloud is just a a, a pseudo term defining network storage on the internet. It's not something new. It's been around since the 70s, and they've just rebranded it to make it sound cool. Um, <laughs> really, it's, it's, it's legit. <laughs> so the, the cloud or n- computers out there on the Internet, where is your data being stored? That's kind of the question. Is if, if I, as a Canadian citizen protected under the Canadian Privacy Act, am storing my stuff in the cloud down in the United States that is not protected by the Canadian Privacy Act, who has access to my data? Can the government read my stuff and look at my pictures? I don't know why they would, but I'm just saying there are privacy concerns there. Do you know where your stuff is? And also, (coughs) is it, again, is it redundant? Again, people will move their stuff to the cloud, and then what happens if the cloud goes down? What happens if something weird happens and for some reason you lose access to your account? What if somebody hacks your account and deletes all the stuff and it's gone? What if people get a hold of many cloud accounts? Like, Yeah. Hackers are at work. Who knows? <laughs> but then you're in a... That's, again, that's great for redundancy if it's a secondary copy. Absolutely. Um, but don't ever move your stuff. No. No. Always at least copy. Don't just move or replace. <laughs> um, also, Garby was saying that Carbonite is a nice and secure, or you can use Amazon EC2 service, and it, it builds up a backup setup there as well. Oh, yeah? I've Maybe like an S3 account or something, and you could save your stuff. But that's, that's again, looking at cloud storage and things. And yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> so I hope, if anything, that you understand tonight that we need to, you need to have more than one copy. If you have anything on your systems that is important to you. I think of family photos. Make sure you copy them tonight to another hard drive. And if you don't have another hard drive and you've got a laptop at home, do some kind of fandangled thing and copy. Don't move. Copy that stuff over to that laptop so that if something happens to your computer, you've got an extra copy. And then don't let anyone steal your laptop. No. Yeah. Nope, nope. All right. We're just, uh, we're practically out of time here. Oh. Um, I, I, we're running on an, a s- solid state drive tonight. <laughs> I put a solid state drive into the server, which is very, very cool. Um, it runs at 555 megabytes per second. 
read and 515 write. But one of the things that we're working on, because we've got the Cottage Special coming up next Tuesday night, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be in Halliburton, uh, Ontario, and uh, hope that you can join us there. We've got lots of great prizes sponsored by LEI Electronics, and uh, just thrilled to have them as a part of it. We're going to be there. We've got live music with Eric Kidd. And it's just going to be a great time with our cottage special this year. Uh, looking forward to being at Silver Beach Developments with Jerry uh, again this year. You remember Jerry Kowalski from last year. So as part of that, we needed to make the server portable. You'll see in my blog, baldnerd.com, that uh, we really needed to make that server portable because I had five of these bad boys. Big old heavy hard drives. You can feel the weight of that. It's, it's awfully heavy. Five of them? Five of them. That's like a whole bag, I don't know, like a laptop. These are enterprise bag. drives that were in two RAID zeros. I've got a, a weight scale here. Here we go. <laughs> so let's see. Okay, we're going to reset that. The weight is 656 grams. So five of those is almost three and a half kilograms. Somewhere in around there. A little bit more than three and, and a half how kilograms. How much is... This is like light as nothing. It's ooh. It's literally. It's like it, it could be in there, and you wouldn't know the difference. They they weigh nothing. There are no moving parts. That's the key thing. So the, the we've cut down the weight, but we've also reduced the. This was my concern: is jostling during mm -hmm. move, movement. So we have the cottage special next week. We've got the uh, fifth anniversary party on the twenty fifth of September, and of course we're moving into our new studio before that time, uh, August twenty seventh, I believe it is that we'll be. Ooh, in the new studio. That's what I moved. Check, check the calendar at category5.tv. <laughs> yeah. Always cool. keep in touch. <laughs> so that's where we're at. Hey, thanks everybody for being here. Erica, thank you for being here. Uh, no nice problem. It's nice to get away from college country back in the Barry. Yeah, yeah. And here I go <laughs> on my way up. So we'll see you from uh, Halliburton, Ontario next Tuesday night. Make sure you join us live. Uh, and of course, if you are in Halliburton, make sure you join us in studio at, uh, we call it in studio, but at Silver Beach Developments. We've got lots of prizes to give away. We're looking forward to having you there as our studio audience. Uh, and again, Eric Kidd is going to be there with me, co-hosting and performing live music as well. So oh, it's going to be a be great good. time. Yeah, it's going to be fun. So looking forward to it. I am going to be a little bit more tanned, a little bit more relaxed. I'll and, never uh, be tanned, and I'll be a little bit more <laughs> cooking. There you go. All right. Take care, everyone. Awesome. Have a fantastic week. We'll see you later. See ya.